Estamos ao vivo. We are live. Ok. Uh, bem, uh, boa noite a todos que estão acompanhando uh, mais, mais um evento, mais uma edição do evento Nas Trilhas do Rock. Uh, estamos na terceira edição do, desse evento, né? E esse ano o tema é Psicodelia e Underground Anglo-Americano. E como palestrante uh, para fazer a abertura desse evento, nós trouxemos, convidamos e Gostaria de agradecer, depois a Lívia poderia dizer isso para ele, que eu estou agradecendo muitíssimo a, a presença dele, é, que é um, um autor com o qual aqui no Grupo de Estudos Culturais nós dialogamos muito com a obra dele, né, que é o professor Edward McCann. E vou fazer uma breve apresentaçãozinha, né? Uh, o professor Eduardo é educador musical, percussionista e pianista, uh, leciona no uh, College of Redwoods, em Eureka, Califórnia, e entre suas publicações mais famosas estão Rock in the Classics, English Progressive Rock and the Counterculture, e uh, Endless Enigma, uh, a musical biography of Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Uh, além disso, ele tem alguns CDs é, já lançados, né, como como músico. Então agora eu só vou passar a palavra rapidinho para o César uh, explicar para quem tiver aqui na audiência, né, no YouTube, como que vocês podem enviar perguntas depois. Então mais uma vez eu agradeço a presença de todos e e principalmente a presença do professor Edward. César. Uh, então uh, uh, durante a palestra se uh, quem estiver assistindo quiser uh, fazer perguntas e colocar no chat do YouTube, uh, após a palestra a gente vai ler as perguntas e passar algumas para o professor responder. Então fiquem à vontade aí para colocar tanto no final da palestra quanto durante uh, as perguntas que vocês desejarem. Bom, é, então acho que nós podemos começar. Uh, Lívia, você só poderia uh, passar essa que eu falei, de agradecer muito a presença? do professor aqui, e aí podemos é, iniciar. Professor Edward McCann, uh, we would like to thank you for your presence, and we have just introduced you, and uh, we have said how important your work is to the group. Thank you. You can start whenever you well, greetings. It is my honor to speak before you today, and thank you for the invitation. And a special thank you to Jose Cesar for his work in facilitating this since I think it was last July, many months now a preparation. <laughs> so today has finally come and it is my pleasure to be here. So I'm calling this, pre this presentation, the long, shadow of the hallucinatory art, psychedelic rock as linchpin of rock musical evolution. And I hope that by the end of this presentation, that title will make sense. If it does not, that is why we will have questions when I am done. Given the distance in musical style, sensibility, and conceptual content between the mid-50s rock and roll of Elvis, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, and Jerry Lee Lewis, and the psychedelic rock of the late 1960s, it is startling that the evolution from the former to the latter took place in little more than a decade. Perhaps it is even more startling that the shift from the brill-building pop of the early 1960s that succeeded the first wave of rock and roll to psychedelic rock took place in little more than half a decade. It seems counterintuitive that changes of the scope involved in the shift from 50s rock and roll or early 60s brill building pop to late 60s psychedelic rock could have taken place so quickly. On the other hand, Careful listening reveals 
A number of primary characteristics of late 60s psychedelic rock were already inherent in the earlier rock styles. This is not to say that it was somehow inevitable that earlier rock and roll would develop into psychedelic rock, simply that the possibility was always there, merely requiring a certain combination of internal and external triggers to bring them to fruition. Indeed, the central thesis of my presentation today is that psychedelic rock is a significant linchpin, arguably the single most significant linchpin in the stylistic evolution of rock music. This may seem like an excessive claim given that psychedelic rock, at least in its original incarnation, only had about a four year window and was so clearly tied to the cultural and socio-political developments of its time. My argument, however, is that psychedelic rock role in rock music history. It collected together a number of potentially subversive but underdeveloped elements of earlier rock and roll styles, transformed them in a way that addressed the historical and cultural issues of its own time, and evolved into a multifaceted musical style that eventually branched out in several different and even somewhat contradictory directions as it dissolved at the end of the 1960s. Indeed, as I will demonstrate below, it remains a significant source of influence and inspiration decades after the peak of our, its artistic, cultural, and commercial impact. With this thesis in mind, I will begin with a brief survey of the first 10 years of rock and roll that focuses on those styles that were part of psychedelic rock's direct lineage. I will proceed to survey the origins of psychedelic rock, including its relationship to the substances for which it was named, and an analysis of its primary musical characteristics. I will end with a consideration of its dissolution into a number of new styles that would be of considerable significance to the 1970s, and its continuing relevance as a potent source of later revivals after 1980. Given the relentless recycling of the first wave of rock and roll as nostalgia and so-called oldies music, it is easy to forget that beneath its mostly inoffensive lyrics lurked a deeply subversive musical style whose anarchic undercurrents were easily detected by those who were over 30 years of age when it emerged. Its driving beat, energized rhythms, intense vocal delivery, and frenetic stage show suggested a barely suppressed sexual energy unrivaled by previous forms of popular music, and a blending of black and white music Musical stylizations drawn from rhythm and blues and rockabilly, respectively, that were fundamentally unsettling to a still segregated America. Perhaps Middle America's reaction to this music at the time of its maximal influence is best captured in the 1958 movie High School Confidential. The movie opens with Jerry Lee Lewis and his band rolling by a tidy, orderly high school on a flatbed truck, performing their new hit, High School Confidential. Immediately thereafter, the troubled anti-hero, played by Russ Tamblin, appears on screen, and order descends into chaos as the movie's tortured plot is set into motion. In terms of plot development, Jerry Lee Lewis's presence is extraneous. He is never seen again. The underlying message, however, could not be clearer. Rock and roll is an anarchic force inextricably bound up with teenage delinquency, drug abuse, and crime. Indeed, to make sure the viewer gets the point, 
the legitimate front business of the villain of the movie, the local drug lord, is selling and maintaining jukeboxes that play rock and roll music. Ironically, by the time of this movie's release, the first wave of rock and roll had essentially run its course. Nonetheless, its subversive potential was far from exhausted, and for at least the next decade, it offered younger musicians working in newer styles a rich load of possibilities to mine. The Brill Building pop of the early 1960s is often, and in my view, correctly, understood as an attempt by the music industry of the day to, if not shove the rock and roll genie of the 1950s back into its bottle, to tame it, whiten it up in the sense of de-emphasizing its black lineage, and de-eroticize it. Its production is much more refined than 1950s rock and roll, reflecting still lingering Tin Pan Alley influences and the music of its most representative acts, Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons, the various girl groups produced by Phil Spector, mostly banishes the breakneck tempos, distorted electric guitar, pounding boogie-woogie piano, an intense vocal delivery of 50 rock, 50s rock and roll in favor of clean vocal harmonies, lush orchestral backdrops, especially courtesy of Spectre's wall of sound arrangements, and bright, trebly production. The West Coast surf rock that emerged at almost precisely the same time most famously represented by the vocal surf rock of the Beach Boys, but also by the instrumental surf rock of Dick Dale, exhibits many of the same characteristics. Nonetheless, psychedelic rock would eventually ferret out the subversive potential of both Spectre's wall of sound production and Dale's guitar innovations. In the early 1960s, young people looking for aesthetically progressive music were unlikely to be interested in rock and roll. Rather, they were likely to seek out contemporary jazz, particularly the modal jazz of John Coltrane. Likewise, a young person looking for politically progressive music likely would look to urban folk. Not surprisingly, in the progressive haunts of that day, such as New York City, particularly New York City's Greenwich Village and San Francisco, these were the musics one was likely to encounter in the clubs. Well into the 50s, the urban folk movement was considered subversive, but for very different reasons than the first wave of rock and roll. While early rock and roll was despised for its so-called barbaric musical style, the much more sedate, polite urban folk style was feared for its links with the labor movement and left-wing politics. This fear grew exponentially after the commencement of the Red Scare, with the leading folk group of the 50s, the Weavers, being blacklisted for a time because of their alleged communist sympathies. As the Red Scare subsided and a reaction to the McCarthyism that drove it set in at the end of the 1950s, urban folk became a significant commercial phenomenon. Some of the major acts, such as the King Ticks, other major urban folk acts of the late 50s and early 60s, such as Joan Baez, continued earlier folks' engagement with left-wing causes, which increasingly included the struggle against segregation, which was occupying political progressives of the early 1960s. It was into this musical and cultural matrix that Bob Dylan emerged, releasing his first three albums in 1962, 1963, and 1964, respectively. The last of these, The Times They Are a Changin', use his spare folk style as the vehicle for a politics that in many ways remains radical some 60 years 
later. At precisely the same time Dylan's early career as a folk music hero was playing out, the UK saw the emergence, seemingly out of nowhere, of a vibrant rock and roll scene. As is almost universally known, the most important band of this scene was the Beatles. Two points about the Beatles' emergence bear highlighting here. First, the Beatles began as the Quarrymen, a skiffle band. Skiffle being a fusion of folk music, rural blues, and American rockabilly. Many of Britain's most significant rockers of the 1964 to 1976 period emerged out of a skiffle background. And it seems likely that many of the most significantly distinctive British musical mannerisms of the Beatles and other early to mid-60s British bands, above all, their fondness for modal harmony, stem from this background. Second, it bears repeating that the Beatles, who were out of Liverpool, saw themselves as revivalists of the first wave of American rock and roll. Their sound, called Mercy Beat, often was contrasted with that of the vibrant urban blues revival scene of London, where bands such as John Mayall's Blues Breakers and Alexis Corner's Blues Incorporated served as a training ground for musicians who would soon staff the Rolling Stones and the Yardbirds, and slightly later, Cream and Led Zeppelin. By the time the Beatles finally appeared in the United States in February 1964, having already released two albums in the United Kingdom, they were pop music sensations, having molded 1950s rock and roll, refractions of contemporary brill building pop in early Motown styles, and a distinctly musical, a distinctly British musical sensibility into a highly original and individual sound. Over the next 18 months, the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Animals, and the Who would all score smash hits in the United States market and the so-called British invasion of the US music scene had begun. On the surface, there is no reason Bob Dylan would have been interested in the Beatles or any of the other bands of the British invasion scene. Already considered an auteur, his fans were politically conscious young adults, not screaming teeny boppers. Yet in August 1964, Dylan famously met the Beatles in a New York hotel where he supposedly introduced them to cannabis for the first time. The Beatles were both flattered by his interest and impressed by the aura of critical acclaim that surrounded him. Dylan, for his part, had been intrigued by the Beatles' harmonies from the time he first heard them earlier that year and famously remarked, I knew they were pointing the direction of where music had to go. Dylan was growing impatient with the purism and traditionalism of the folk music scene and was beginning to entertain the possibility of a different kind of songwriting. Although overplaying the significance of this one meeting feeds into the kind of great men of history narrative that Dylan's and the Beatles' generation were trying to move away from, in fact, within months of this meeting, both were pursuing very different directions than they had before, directions that would profoundly impact the trajectory of popular music during the second half of the 1960s. Beginning with his fourth album, Dylan's lyrics began to move away from straightforward socio-political commentary into a more ambiguous surrealism featuring rich, evocative imagery that often appears to contain multiple levels of meaning. By his fifth album, Bringing It All Back Home, 
released in 1965, this new approach is forefronted, nowhere more so than in the first song on side two of the LP format, Mr. Tambourine Man. A cursory listen to Tambourine Man does not reveal how far Dylan had shifted from his 1962 to 1964 output. The music is still mostly acoustic, the lone exception a subtle, subdued electric guitar part dubbed in the sonic background. However, once one begins to follow the lyrics closely, it is evident Dylan is occupying a very different space than before. While many have pointed to the lyric's apparent drug references, in fact, Dylan wrote Tambourine Man in early 1964, before he was introduced to LSD. Nonetheless, in this song, he has shifted from lyrics that denote to lyrics that connote. That is to say, in his first three albums, the intent of the lyric is clear. He addresses particular topics in a way that you know both what he is addressing and what his view is concerning the topic he is addressing. In Tambourine Man, he piles evocative images on top of each other. The result is not, as some suggested at the time, a meaningless lyric, but rather a lyric that contains multiple shades of meaning, which, because the meanings are not nailed down, so to speak, may be interpreted differently by different individuals. This approach suggests a new kind of politics that in some ways is even more subversive than the politics of his earlier music, but also vaguer and harder to define. It also triggers a looser approach to musical form. While there is still a recognizable verse and chorus to Tambourine Man, the lengths of the verses, in particular, become irregular, as the rhythms become freer, and the verses and choruses alternate more unpredictably. Just a few months after the release of Bringing It All Back Home, Dylan would famously plug in at the 1965 Newport Folk Festival with the Paul Butterfield Blues Band accompanying him. After Dylan merged the sonic power and rhythmic drive of rock and roll with urban folk's legacy of social conscience and political commentary in his three epochal folk rock albums of 1965 and 1966, bringing it all back home, Highway 61 Revisited, and Blonde on Blonde, American popular music was never the same. The urban folk revival petered out, absorbed into the mainstream of rock music. And from the mid-60s on, we speak of rock rather than rock and roll to differentiate the new phase of rock music history that Dylan inaugurated. As for the Beatles, the Dylan meeting appeared to turbocharge their own musical evolution. Rubber Soul, released in December 1965, finds the band absorbing Dylan's new kind of lyric, further broadening their musical style by drawing on elements of contemporary American folk rock and Indian classical music, demonstrating a new command of the possibilities of the recording studio, and showing a new concern for the album as a cohesive whole. By the end of 1965, then, the direction of the new rock music had decisively shifted, with Dylan spearheading a vibrant American folk rock scene, and the Beatles, an equally vibrant school, so to speak, of British bands that were taking not only their own nation, but the United States, by storm. Even before the dust had settled on the emergence of these two epochal developments in rock music history, however, a new trend began, a trend that soon enough would be known as psychedelic rock. Lysergic acid diethylamide, aka LSD, was not always controversial. 
first synthesized by Swiss chemist Albert Hofmann in 1938, it maintained a low profile until the late 1950s when it began to be touted as a potential wonder drug for psychotherapeutic purposes. However, its salad days did not last long. By 1964, public opinion was turning against it due to so purported instances of psychotic reactions and accidental suicides. And in 1965, the United States government banned LSD distribution with Sandoz Laboratories, the original manufacturer, recalling all existing supplies. However, the genie was out of the bottle. By 1966, individuals were producing LSD at home and selling it in an increasingly bustling black market. Shortly before the LSD ban went into effect, writer Ken Kesey organized a series of acid tests in the San Francisco Bay Area where participants took LSD in order to enhance their experience of a rotating series of multimedia presentations. The house band for the so-called test was a then mostly unknown band that had been called the Warlocks, but now were called the Grateful Dead. The test proved so popular that in 1966, promoter Bill Graham began a series of weekly sequels at his venue, the Fillmore in San Francisco, featuring a who's who's of the bands who would spearhead the Bay Area psychedelic scene. The Dead, Jefferson Airplane, the Quicksilver Messenger Service, the Paul Buttersfield Blues Band, who, as we saw, had already achieved fame by accompanying Dylan when he first plugged in at Newport Folk Festival the previous year, and the 13th Floor Elevators. This latter band, although never attaining the importance or longevity, or if we are to be honest, the quality of the Grateful Dead or the Jefferson Airplane, did create history with their album of August 1966, The Psychedelic Sounds of the 13th Floor Elevators, the first album to explicitly tie itself to the psychedelic movement, with liner notes that celebrated the, the potential of man, quote unquote, to chemically alter his mental state, restructure his thinking, and change his language. End quote. The new psychedelic music initially reflected not so much a new musical language as a distinct fusion of existing styles. The folk rock of Dylan and his acolytes, the music of the heavier British invasion bands such as the Kinks and the Who, perhaps channeled through mid-60s American garage rock, surf rock, modal jazz, especially John Coltrane, modern avant-garde classical music, especially the music of Karl Heinz Stockhausen, who actually was resident at nearby University of California at Davis during the 1966-1967 academic year. In the mid-1960s, it was very much in the air. So on Middle Eastern modes to color some of his most characteristic surf compositions of the early 1960s. By 1965, British invasion bands were beginning to pioneer a so-called raga rock subgenre. The Yardbirds, in their heart full of soul, and the kinks in See My Friends used electric guitars to evoke the drone-like quality of the Indian sitar, while the Beatles became the first rock band to use an actual sitar in Norwegian Wood in 
from their album, Rubber Soul. By 1966, vibrant psychedelic rock scenes had begun to develop not only in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also in Los Angeles and London. A host of clubs had opened that catered to the new music, such as the Avalon Ballroom in San Francisco, the Whiskey A Go Go in Los Angeles, the UFO Club, and the Middle Earth in London. And established rock musicians had taken note. The grand finale of the Beatles album Revolver, released in August 1966, is Tomorrow Never Knows, arguably the first commercially available recording of psychedelic rock, given that Revolver was released 12 days earlier than the psychedelic sounds of the 13th floor elevators. John Lennon adopted the lyrics of this song from Timothy Leary's book, The Psychedelic Experience, a manual based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Here we should directly address Timothy Leary, the apostle of LSD, who, at the Human Being held at San Francisco's Golden Gate Park on January 14, 1967, uttered his famous dictum, turn on, tune in, drop out. Under Leary's influence, a sizable segment of the hippie subculture came to view hallucinogen taking as a form of political protest, believing that LSD and other hallucinogens opened new portals of consciousness that mainstream society, the establishment, as they called it, was intent on ignoring. After the 60s ended, Leary's original intent was lost, the increasingly pervasive assumption being he had simply called for people to get wasted. During the late 1960s, however, he was serious about hallucinogens as a vehicle for political transformation, believing that someone who had undergone the hallucinogenic experience would no longer support endless war, systemic racism, suicidal environmental exploitation, and the other follies of late industrial society. And he was taken seriously as a genuine menace to the existing social order by the establishment that he railed against. He was arrested 36 times and allegedly called the most dangerous man in America by President Richard Nixon. Like some other 20th century revolutionaries and would-be revolutionaries, Leary had a clearly developed idea of how, how art might serve his political vision. In 1966, calling for a hallucinatory art, that psychedelic rock appeared to be an almost instantaneous answer to. Obviously, Leary's psychedelic revolution did not bring about the political change he hoped for for a host of reasons that would take much more time to address than is possible here. It did, however, profoundly affect both the consumption and the nature of late 60s rock. Regarding the former, because of the hippies' fondness for tripping on hallucinogens, listening to music, often to the accompaniment of a light show, was much more a part of late 60s culture than was dancing. That is, between 1965 and 1970, cutting-edge rock music became a music to be actively listened to rather than danced to. Not surprisingly, as hippies began to view their music as primarily a forum for listening rather than dancing, musicians began to experiment with unusual rhythms, complex textures, new tone colors, and lengthy multi-sectional structures that had few parallels in earlier styles of popular music. Was there an actual psychedelic rock style? Michael Hicks, in his brilliant exegesis of psychedelic rock from his book, 60s Rock, called Getting Psyched, argues that there was and describes it as follows. He says, 
psychedelic is extremely loud, reverberant, contrapuntal rock, slowed in tempo, unstable in harmony, and juxtapositional in form. What is more, to be truly psychedelic, at least some of the music's parameters must go through devices that create molten shapes in timbre, articulation, and spatial placement. I agree with all the characteristics Hicks list here, but would add one more. Most often, vocal psychedelic rock, which is to say the substantial majority of it, uses Dylan's new kind of connotative, more or less surreal lyric. Hicks argues that there are three specific aspects of the psychedelic experience that shape the music. Decronization, depersonalization, and dynamization. Decronization involves moving outside the conventional perceptions of time. As Hicks notes, on the simplest level, decronization lengthens songs and slows them down. In regards to tempo, one, only one need only think of some of the most iconic psychedelic rock songs. Iron Butterflies in Agata da Vida. Jimi Hendrix's Purple Haze, The Doors, The End, or pretty much any of Pink Floyd's late 1960s psychedelic epics. Indeed, it seems significant that many of the new musical genres that emerged around 1970, funk, roots reggae, early metal, continue psychedelic rock's predilection for slowish tempos. In regards to song length, it would be tedious to cite all the well-known psychedelic rock tracks that are longer than 10 minutes in length. It should merely be noted that the expansiveness of psychedelic rock was unparalleled in any earlier rock music style and indeed in any earlier style of American popular music. There are a number of more subtle ways that decronization manifests itself in psychedelic rock. Here, I will cite only two. First, the tendency of some longer tracks to slowly assemble themselves out of fragmentary musical gestures. The Doors, The End, and Pink Floyd's Careful With That Axe, Eugene, come to mind. Second, the new importance of seemingly endlessly repeated bass guitar figures, or ostinatos, often used to support slowly expanding guitar or organ solos. The effect of such music is often that of near stasis, to which the raga rock ideal of a droning guitar or sitar is closely related. By depersonalization, Hicks refers to one losing the self and gaining an awareness of undifferentiated unity. Here, Hicks notes the importance of the band to the psychedelic rock style. To a much greater degree than earlier rock and roll styles, there is no longer a clear distinction between lead and background. Indeed, a band like The Who whose emergence predates psychedelia, somewhat modified their arrangement approach in the 1969, I'm sorry, 1967 to 1969 period when the psychedelic style was at its peak. One hears a shift in the function of the rhythm section with the bass guitar and drums emerging as equals to lead vocals and guitar and at times becoming not just rhythmic support but melodic counterpoints to them. Hicks notes two additional ways in which depersonalization manifests itself in psychedelic rock music. First is the extraordinarily high volumes many of these bands played at. Indeed, even experienced rock critics of the time were sometimes disturbed by how loud this music was. Loud enough that the listener didn't just hear the music, 
they felt it, became one with it. Hicks also notes the way many psychedelic bands use huge amounts of electronic reverberation to suggest vast spaces. Given that the 1967 through 1969 period marked the peak not only of LSD use, but of the race to the moon, the twin conceits of inner space and outer space were never far away for either the psychedelic rock bands or their hippie audiences. Psychedelic rock's approach to reverb developed out of surf music, which had used it to evoke the ocean. Psychedelic rock musicians and engineers merely used it more pervasively and radically. Indeed, one could go even farther into the past to Bo Diddley's futuristic song, Bo Diddley of 1955, or a hypnotically repeated rhythm overlaid with drone harmony and tremolo and reverb laden electric guitar breaks seems to anticipate several key elements of the psychedelic style. One suspects at least some psychedelic musicians may also have considered Phil Spector's wall of sound arrangement approach a useful template for constructing the impression of vast sonic spaces. By dynamization, Hicks refers to the manner in which the psychedelic experience appears to make physical objects melt. As he puts it, objects become liquid, dripping, streaming with white hot light or electricity. Hicks sees the experience of dynamization impacting the music in three ways, in its form, its harmony, and its timbres. In regard to form, by 1965, bands such as the Yardbirds and the Mothers of Invention were releasing songs, For Your Love and Help I'm a Rock, respectively, in which the modest contrast between verse, chorus, and bridge that had characterized earlier rock music were abandoned in favor of sections that baldly contrasted tempo, style, modality, texture, and instrumentation. By 1966, multi-section songs were becoming the norm in the emerging psychedelic rock sound and, as Hicks notes, by 1967, this process was essentially complete. As bands segued individual songs in such a way as to make a whole album side become a single track. In concert, they played successive songs ataka without pausing from one to the next. Indeed, at the height of psychedelia, non psychedelic rock bands who wished to evoke the style realized they could psychedelicize a song at the macro level by simply juxtaposing sonic blocks. Regarding harmony, psychedelic rock was the most harmonically adventurous rock style at the time of its emergence. And even the more complex progressive rock style that superseded it after 1970 did not extend its harmonic vocab vocabulary in any essential way. Modality, the use of the old church modes or similar modes in place of the modern major and minor scales had already become an important aspect of 1960s rock through the British invasion bands. It was only with the emerging pervasive in rock music. Musicologists such as John Shepard see functional harmonies drive away from and back to the tonic chord as mirroring capitalist society's concept of progress through spatialized time towards some clearly defined goal, and its regularly recurring chord changes, as encapsulating capitalist society's preoccupation with the passing of an objectively measured chronological time. Modality, on the other hand, with its weaker chord progressions and chord hierarchies, and more ambiguous sense of tonic, would seem to mirror precisely 
the kind of acid-induced sense of freedom from time that Timothy Leary hoped that a so-called hallucinatory art would convey. As a result of its pervasive modality, psychedelic rock was characterized by sliding progressions in which chords moved in parallel motion. Often this involved the lowered supertonic chord sliding into the tonic chord. But sometimes the movement is more radical. As in Pink Floyd's Astronomy Domine, where the subdominant chord slides down to the subtonic chord via a series of major triads descending by half step. Root movements between chords are often non-functional. Especially jarring is the progression between the tonic and the tritone heard in the opening of Hendrix's Purple Haze, and between so-called chromatic mediant relationships, that is, progressions of chords with roots a third apart in which one of the chords does not belong in the key. That type of progression is used so often in psychedelic rock, it is pointless to cite just one example. It is not uncommon for a psychedelic rock song to create harmonic ambiguity between alternating tonics, for instance, Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit, The Doors' Strange Days. At its most radical, psychedelic rock sometimes fostered a sense of bitonality, or two distinct tonics sounding simultaneously, which flowed from its wrong note aesthetic. As Jimi Hendrix put it, a central aspect of the psychedelic approach was, quote unquote, playing the opposite notes to what you think the note should be. It's like playing the wrong note seriously, dig? Perhaps the most obvious vehicle for dynamizing psychedelic music, however, was neither form nor harmony, but rather the newfangled studio equipment and effects devices that could be used to render formerly stable timbres molten. There was the fuzz box which Keith Richards' memorable part on the Stone's satisfaction had made a mandatory part of every subsequent rock guitarist arsenal. The wah-wah pedal, associated especially with Eric Clapton during his time with Cream, eventually became something of a psychedelic mannerism. As Hendrix put it, the pedal made an ordinary electric guitar line sound like something is reaching out. Feedback once avoided, increasingly was cultivated as an expressive gesture, with Hendrix, its greatest practitioner, ultimately turning it into a kind of psychedelic fanfare. Backtracking was introduced by the Beatles engineer George Martin. Its psychedelic potential was obvious, as it turned the decay of a note into an attack instead. George Harrison's solo in The Beatles' Tomorrow Never Knows and Hendrix's solo during RU Experience offer especially memorable examples. Another innovation, phasing, involves superimposing the same parts at minutely different speeds. The Beatles' Blue Jay Way offers an especially exaggerated example. Finally, Stereo panning complemented reverb as an effort to suggest fast spaces where sound drifted from side to side. Psychedelic rock bands often experimented with exaggerated panning effects in their mixes. As Hicks put it, feedback and phasing had been flaws in the past. Wah-wah, backtracking, and stereo panning had been novelties. But all of them became fundamentals of the hallucinatory art in music. Traditional rock historiography has identified two subsets of psychedelic rock, West Coast and British. I would suggest thinking rather in terms of three, Bay Area, Los Angeles, and British. The major acts of San Francisco Bay Area psych were heavily impacted by American folk, or I should say American root styles, particularly earlier acoustic styles such as rural blues, early country, folk, 
and bluegrass. Bay Area site tends to be utopian in its message and communitarian, indeed almost anti-capitalist in its practice, perhaps best reflected in the Grateful Dead's encouragement of its fans exchanging bootleg recordings. Politically, a lot of this music anticipates the philosophy of modern-day Green parties. Los Angeles and Southern California site tends to be heavier musically, showing a greater debt than Bay Area site to urban blues and mid-60s garage rock. It tends to be darker in its subject matter. While similarly anti-establishment, in contrast to the collectivist, socialist worldview of the Bay Area bands, it strikes a more individualist, anarchist, libertarian philosophy. Its major bands include The Doors, Steppenwolf, Iron Butterfly, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention, and Alice Cooper, which originated in Phoenix, but moved to Los Angeles when it became clear the Phoenix music scene of the time could not support their aspirations. While the British psychedelic scene did not feature the disjunction of political sensibilities that one observes between Bay Area and LA psychedelic scenes, it too displayed a duality of musical style, especially between guitar-oriented bands and those in which keyboards played a major role. The former, most notably the Yardbirds, Cream, and the Hendrix Experience, were rooted in the London urban blues revival of the early 1960s and played a heavier guitar-based rock that would flow relatively seamlessly into the early metal of Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, and Deep Purple, as the 1960s passed into the early 1970s. On the other side were bands in which keyboards played a more prominent role. Just as psychedelia must be credited for introducing a slew of effects devices and studio techniques into the mainstream of rock music, it also forefronted keyboard instruments in an unprecedented way. Piano had, of course, been central to the earliest rock and roll. The British invasion bands brought combo organs such as the Vox Continental or Jaguar or one of the Farfisa models. Relatively lightweight organs, usually transistorized, with a bright reedy sound that could be modified to a limited extent by a rocker switches, tabs, or drawbars, into common use. These were carried over into the psychedelic rock movement. The two West Coast psych bands that made keyboards central to their sound, The Doors and Iron Butterfly, both featured the Vox Continental. However, in the music of the British psychedelic bands that paved the way for full-blown 1970s progressive rock, the Moody Blues, Procol Harum, Pink Floyd, and the Nice. I like to call them the big four of British proto-progressive rock. One notes further innovations. First is the introduction of the Mellotron, an invention of the early 1960s that produced sound by running a strip of tape across a replay head. Its library of pre-recorded string, woodwind, and choral voicings allowing a keyboard player to evoke a string orchestra or a large choir. The Beatles sporadically used it as something of a novelty item. The Moody Blues, on the other hand, made it central to their sound. Second is the displacement of the combo organs by the larger, more mechanically complex Hammond organ. Procol Harum used it as a substitute pipe organ in their best-known songs, such as A Wire Shade of Pale. While the nicest keyboardist, Keith Emerson, who was called the Hendrix of the organ in the late 1960s, ran his Hammond through a Leslie rotor speaker, mic'd it, and ran the mic's speaker through a Marshall amplifier to create the gritty, overdriven sound with exaggerated key click that would become central to later rock music. There were other differences between these four bands. 
The Moody Blues and Procol Harum remained essentially song-based in the manner of the Beatles, while Pink Floyd and the Nice were much more given to long sections of instrumental stretching out. They were united, however, by their use of keyboards as another method for creating a sense of huge sonic space. Cathedral-like, in the case of the Hammond, or symphonic, in the case of the Mellotron. Psychedelic rock emerged suddenly in 1965 and 1966. It dissolved a bit less suddenly between 1969 and 1971. Cream played their final shows at the end of 1968 and released their final studio album in 1969. Frank Zappa disbanded the Mothers of Invention in late 1969. When he reformed them a year later, it was as the Mothers, and their music changed substantially. Keith Emerson disbanded the Nice in early 1970. Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin died within a month of each other in September and October 1970. Joplin had by then left Big Brother and the Holding Company and had formed the Full Tilt Boogie Band. The Doors released their final album with Jim Morrison in April 1971. He died less than three months later. Jefferson Airplane essentially dissolved in 1972. They would later reconvene as the more polished and commercially oriented Jefferson Starship. The only two major psychedelic rock bands that continued on uninterrupted through the 1970s were Pink Floyd, who gradually shifted to a progressive rock that smoothed out and tightened up their trippy late 1960s soundscapes, and the Grateful Dead, who explored a plethora of styles during the 1970s, united mainly by their continuing commitment to improvisation and spontaneity. Perhaps even more important to the dissipation of psychedelic rock than the disappearance of so many of its principal musicians and bands in a rel relatively short period was the emergence of a series of new rock styles out of the psychedelic lineage. Perhaps the two most significant were progressive or prog rock and early or classic metal. Arguably, the two key moments in the emergence of prog rock were the first album of King Crimson, released in October 1969, and the first album of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, a group founded by Keith Emerson and Greg Lake after Emerson had disbanded the Nice and Lake had left King Crimson in November 1970. Emerson's explanation for why he broke up the Nice may offer one of the clearest descriptions of the difference between psychedelic rock and the styles that emerged out of it around 1970. To quote Emerson, no longer could it be okay to freak out indiscriminately. No longer could it be okay to scream and shout lyrics. We had had our fun and as the seventies approached, I prepared myself for a decade of control. We'll remember that Michael Hicks described the psychedelic rock style as follows. Psychedelic is extremely loud, reverberant, contrapuntal rock, slow in tempo, unstable in harmony, and juxtapositional in form. What is more, to be truly psychedelic, at least some of the music's parameters must go through devices that create molten shapes in timbre, articulation, and spatial placement. Prog rock continued to develop psychedelic rock's contrapuntal textures, adventurous harmony, and juxtapositional structures. Just as psych drew on certain elements of earlier rock styles, and develop them more single-mindedly than their progenitors had, so did prog rock musicians with psych. Psychedelic rock had brought a new level of instrumental virtuosity to rock music with guitarists like Hendrix and Clapton. 
Prague Rock pursued virtuosity even more insistently, not only in terms of individual solos, but in terms of the entire ensemble's ability to navigate networks of odd and shifting meters. Psychedelic rock had shown a new interest in keyboard instruments, and as a result of the influx of classically trained keyboard players in European classical music, above all the music of J.S. Bach. Prague rock would go much further in its integration of both keyboard instruments, especially the newfangled analog synthesizers of the 1970s, and classical music techniques into the classical music techniques and structures into the mainstream of rock. Perhaps it is the differences, however, that are most significant. As Emerson's quote suggests, prog rock reacted against the perceived formlessness of the long instrumental passages of psychedelic rock. Prog rock tends to be more tightly structured and systematically composed with a relative de-emphasis on improvisation, which generally is consigned to specific sections. It also reacted against it, what it perceived as the excess use of reverberation. While prog rock is, like psych, contrapuntal, its parts generally do not bleed into each other the way they often had in psych, but remain clearly separated in the mix. In short, Prague transforms many of the most significant features of psych to make it appropriate, or uh, to, I should say maybe, uh, make it an appropriate musical style for a decade of control. At the risk of drawing an overburdened analogy between the music and the era that it emerged in, perhaps we might put it this way. The cutting edge music, of the 70s sought to bring structure and organization to the explosive musical innovations of the 60s in the same way that the politics of the 70s sought to come to terms with and integrate the new concerns with racial and gender equality and environmental stewardship that had exploded to the forefront in the 1960s. Although the early metal of Zeppelin which developed out of the Yardbirds much the same way that Emerson, Lake, and Palmer developed out of the Nice. Deep Purple and Black Sabbath is quite different from the prog rock of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Yes, Genesis, and King Crimson. Its development out of and away from psychedelic rock shows certain common features. Again, the forms tighten up, excessive reverb is eliminated, and textures are clarified. And an aggressive, very masculine virtuosity, which was more exclusively soloistic and less ensemble oriented than in progressive rock, is forefronted. In my book, Rocking the Classics, English the Progressive Rock and the Counterculture, I argued that 1970s prog rock carried on the Ap Apollonian legacy of psych in its grappling with philosophical and socio-political topics, while early metal carried on the Dionysian legacy of psych in its celebration of masculine sexual energy, its focus on heavy and often negative emotional states, and on occult subject matter. While I now believe the way I formulated this idea may have been a bit simplistic, I still believe there is something to be said for the idea itself. Prague rock and early metal, when considered simultaneously as two sides of a larger meta-style, meta logically carry forward different aspects of the musical, social, and political legacies of the psychedelic rock movement into the 1970s. And to be sure, psychedelic rock's legacy during the 1970s did not end with prog rock, early metal, or the styles that would emerge from them. To the contrary, it affected styles from jazz rock fusion, especially the Mahavishnu Orchestra, whose music can accurately be described as a blending of psychedelic rock, modal jazz, and Indian classical music, to funk, 
especially through the various groups headed by George Clinton, which blended funk and psych, to Southern rock, where bands such as the Allman Brothers and ZZ Top melded elements of guitar-based psychedelic rock, country music, and jump blues. Indeed, it is worth pointing up again that the generally slower tempos of the styles that emerged at the end of the 1960s, funk, roots reggae, early metal, are almost certainly a legacy of the psychedelic revolution. Nor should the legacy of psychedelic rock be understood to have dissipated at the point the 70s styles that developed out of it ran their course. To the contrary, it is only around 1980 that the long history of neo-psychedelic revivals began. They first emerged out of Britain's early 80s post-punk scene, producing most famously Echo and the Bunnymen. This was followed in the U.S. by the so-called Paisley Underground Movement in California, which reached its peak in the mid-1980s. Two scenes that became popular in the UK and in the US during the mid to late 1980s, the free festival scene in the UK and the jam band scene in the US have strong ties to psychedelia. In the UK, the Osric Tentacles, who are probably the most important band to emerge from the free festival scene, evoke the psychedelic and progressive rock, or I should say the psychedelic slash progressive rock fusion of the 70s British French act Gong, while in the U.S., Fish, a band deeply influenced by the Grateful Dead, became a major touring act through the jam band scene, as did the Dave Matthews Band. Yet another psychedelic revival emerged in the late 1980s and early 1990s through the so-called shoegaze wing, a British alternative rock. Finally, the 1990s drone rock of acts such as the Icelandic band Cigar Rose and the various projects led by the New Zealand guitarist Roy Montgomery must be understood as another wave of psychedelic revival. Indeed, by the 1990s, the legacy of psychedelic rock was no longer confined to rock. The house, techno, and transforms of electronic dance music that emerged out of the 1980s and 1990s rave scene are all indebted to the ethos and to many of the general aims, if not necessarily to the specific techniques of psychedelic rock. Indeed, it is significant that the various revivals and continuations described here have tended to be underground phenomena with the musicians associated with them who have achieved commercial success being much more the exceptions than the rule. This suggests that unlike so many other musical styles that have come and gone over the past 50 to 60 years, psychedelic rock has never become overcoded. That is to say, its predominant musical gestures have never become comfortably mainstream, but continue to retain a subversive element, allowing it to retain musical relevance for subcultures that resist conforming to the professed values of post-industrial capitalist societies. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Adriano, você queria falar alguma coisa? Não, eu queria agradecer muito a tanto a, a, o conteúdo do texto como a, a maneira como o Professor Eduardo leu. É muito gratificante ouvir a leitura que ele fez e parabenizar demais, agradecer demais tanto em meu nome como em nome do grupo de estudos culturais da Unesp. Lívia, por favor. Lívia, acho que a gente não está te ouvindo muito bem. O seu microfone está aberto, mas a gente não está te ouvindo muito bem. Está me ouvindo? I'm sorry, I cannot hear any of you. 
Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Little technical problem. Uh, so Adriana would like to thank you for your presentation and for all the things you have read wonderfully. And also in name of the study group, he would like to appreciate um, your reading and your lecture. It was my pleasure. Le agradeço. Bom, agora a gente vai passar para as perguntas. Uh, César, agora você assume? We are now going to start the questions. Is that okay, McCann? Acho que a gente pode começar, sim. Ok. Uh, então, a primeira pergunta é do Ricardo Arruda. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble here. Vocês estão me ouvindo? A gente está assim. Eu, uh, eu acredito que a internet do professor McCann está McCann tá com, tá com algum tipo de problema. Professor, uh -huh. can, you, can you hear us? Is there any delays? Acho que está com algum atraso. Né? Uh, your voices are phasing in and out. As nossas vozes estão cortando. Sometimes I hear, sometimes I do not. Okay. I'm wondering. Ai, quando ele cortou. Could you repeat, please? We couldn't hear you. Professor McKen? Eu acho que provavelmente a internet dele deve ter travado. É. Vamos Free. aguardar um momento? Uh -huh. é, se there are tá... if there are questions, cool, so I can see the questions in the chat. And then I can answer them? Is that possible? Sure, sure. I'm going to send you the questions then. Just a second. Okay. Ah, uh, enquanto... Você pode mandar? Ah, não, eu mando. É mais fácil. É, é. é que eu tô sem as... Eu tô... Não tá aberto aqui. Ah, tá. Eu já estou com a seleção aqui. Só um segundinho que eu estou abrindo. Lívia, apenas avisa o professor que você vai falar em português e logo na sequência okay. você traduz. Professor McCann, I'll first uh, ask the question in Portuguese and then I will send to you in English. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, a primeira pergunta é do Ricardo Arruda. Uh, professor McKenna, obrigado pela maravilhosa fala. É possível afirmar que o rock psicodélico também subverteu formas musicais já conhecidas? Não apenas o blues e rock and roll, mas o folk britânico e a música europeia, a exemplo de suítes. So, Professor McCann, uh, he appreciates the wonderful speech, and he asks, is it possible to assert that psychedelic rock also subverted well-known musical forms, not only blues and rock and roll, but British folk and European music, such as suits? Sweets, sorry. Yes, I think so. Um, in terms sim, of the blues, I blues. think that the sub, if if we want to use that term, the subversion, 
of the blues was already underway a year or two before in the music of the Rolling Stones. Como na música dos Rolling Stones. And I think the I think the contribution of the Stones a contribuição dos Stones was that they caught the importance of the riff que eles pegaram a importância do riff from the 12 bar blues form do blues e da could you repeat that the end please sure the rolling stones cut the riff loose from the 12 bar blues form so that you And could have you could structure a song around a riff without blues. follow the chord of the 12 bar blues of the 12 bar the decima segunda form É, eu acredito que o que o professor Maca quis ressaltar também é que os Rolling Stones eles é, desas, desassociaram ou pegaram a, o riff é, do, do formato de 12 compassos do blues uhum. e possibilitaram que esse tipo de riff também fosse usado no rock, na música rock. Vamos para mais uma pergunta. Vamos. É, a próxima pergunta é da Vanessa Pironato. Tendo em vista a influência de Theodore Adorno em seus estudos, como podemos pensar a forma musical do rock psicodélico e do prog? Ou seja, como diferenciá-los em relação à forma musical? Ah, o professor McCann fez um comentário. Ele disse, eu acho que os Stones cortam... É, esse ritmo solto de 12 compassos da forma do blues. Então, você poderia estruturar uma música nesse ritmo, desse riff, sem precisar seguir esses 12 compassos, essa progressão de 12 compassos. Bom, é, agora retomando a pergunta da Vanessa Pironato, eu vou repetir a pergunta em português. Tendo em vista a influência de Theodor Adorno em seus estudos, como podemos pensar a forma musical do rock psicodélico e do prog? Ou seja, como podemos diferenciá-los em relação à forma musical? Um... Só um minuto. Lívia, eu acho que é possível que o professor ainda esteja ah. escrevendo parte tá. da resposta dele, é, mas essa pergunta da Vanessa aí a gente vai fazer ela em seguida, tá só bom. esperar ele terminar de, de digitar, eu acho que ele vai dar uma resposta mais completa. O professor disse que ele acha que alguns, é, alguns, pois não? Ah. alguns psicodélicos até subvertem a forma da sonata, pensando sobre as músicas do Doors, como por exemplo The End e When the Music's Over Where, uh, onde a recapitulação é essencial para o clímax da música. Thank you, professor. Acho que agora a gente pode. Eu acho que ele está digitando. <coughs> 
it should be coming to you. Yeah. Uh, para ele, uh, ouvir a música, principalmente, é, a música, é, o princ... Pera, perdão, deixa eu retomar. Para ele, é, ouvir a música principal é, vem sempre no final e é quase como escutar o tema principal retornando no fim é, de uma sonata do tipo alegro do Beethoven, no movimento alegro. And that happens a lot. Iron Butterfly, Inagata da Vida, Pink Floyd, Interstellar Overdrive, where suddenly out of nowhere, you seem to be lost in this swirl. And then suddenly, boom, you're back in the isso main acontece. part of the song. Isso acontece com frequência. So the element of return is there, but it is a very different sensibility. Isso acontece com frequência. É, você acaba se envolvendo nesse turbilhão de, de coisas. And could you repeat the, the last part, please? Professor McKen? Yes. The I element didn't catch of the return. The, uh -huh. the element, element of return is there. O elemento do retorno está ali. The sensibility of return is a very different é muito in the doors than in Beethoven. Do que em relação ao Beethoven. Ainda assim, essa sensação de, de retorno é bem diferente no caso do The Doors e do Beethoven. Né? Uh, podemos passar para a próxima, Lívia? Sim, sim. Up, yeah. professor. professor, we're going to the next question, ok? Thank you for your answer. Então, a pergunta okay. da Vanessa Pironato, é, vou repetir ela mais uma vez, tendo em vista a influência de Theodor Adorno em seus estudos, como podemos pensar a forma musical do rock psicodélico e do prog, ou seja, como diferenciá-los em relação à forma musical? Um, considering Fyodor Adorno's influence on your studies, how can we think about the musical form of psychedelic rock and prog? In other words, how can we differentiate them in terms of musical, musical form? They are more similar than different. Eles são mais parecidos do que diferentes. That said, Dito isso, there is more improvisation in há mais improvisação than in Prague. No psicodélico do que no I can, I can write this. Oh. Of course. 
Então, como o professor McKenna disse, eles são mais parecidos do que diferentes, mas tem muito mais improvisação no psicodélico do que no progressivo. O progressivo é muito mais... É uma composição mais delicada, mais bem avaliada. E o psicodélico tem uma estética muito próxima do jazz e músicos do psicodélico, é, eles tinham muito mais... É, eles eram muito mais... Eles gostavam muito mais de deixar a música aí onde deveria ir, e para onde ia, é, mesmo que não fosse sempre... É, sempre não tivesse, não tivesse êxito. And I would like to add something specifically about Adorno. Let me do that right now. Ele também gostaria de acrescentar mais uma coisa sobre uma coisa muito específica sobre Adorno. Então, como ele gostaria de adicionar, em termos de adorno, ele argumenta que eh, formas pré-digeridas eram incapazes de verdadeiramente engajar os ouvintes, exceto num nível muito superficial. Ele acreditava que a estrutura surgia de gestos musicais específicos e que desafiavam a audiência. Ele também acredita que o psicodélico alcança isso. Né? É, mais de 50 anos depois, The End e Careful With That Ex Eugene ainda são é, músicas muito difíceis, muito desafiadoras para audiências que não se tornaram confortáveis, elas não se tornaram músicas confortáveis. Would you like to add something, Professor? 
Ele costuma tocar Careful with That Axe Eugene nas, música, nas aulas dele de música popular americana. E geralmente isso assusta os alunos dele. Ok. So can we move I to would the next I just ah. add that I think Ele acha que yeah, sure, sure. Oh, please, please you can say. Yes. I'm sorry. Would you like to add anything, Professor McKen? No, I think I I have pretty much answered that question. Um The best site is challenging music, and it has remained challenging over the decades. And I believe it still speaks to people who are willing to listen to what. E ele acha que essa música ainda fala com as pessoas que se aventuram em escutá-lo. Lívia, acho que a gente podia perguntar ao professor se ele, se ele aceita responder mais uma pergunta, que a gente está se aproximando do tempo que a gente tinha combinado com ele. Professor, are you willing to answer one more question? Because we're reaching the end of our... Yes. Okay. All right. Um... A pergunta do do José César Gomes, uh, ele pergunta, você acha que em alguma das três partes da Bahia de São Francisco, Los Angeles e Londres, a psicodelia se desenvolveu mais? Um, uh, peraí. Uh, do you think that in any of the three parts, San Francisco, Los Angeles and London, psychedelia developed more? That is hard. Hard it's question. Oh, it, developed, it developed differently. Se desenvolveu diferente, de formas diferentes. It developed in different directions. Desenvolveu em formas diferentes, em direções diferentes. San Francisco Psych. A psicodelia de São Francisco. Ended up feeding into what came to be called Heartland Rock about 10 years later. Acabou alimentando o que viria é, ser chamado de Heartland Rock anos depois. The LA, a lot of the LA rock Muito do rock de Los Angeles was clearly foreshadowing heavy metal. Uh, claramente estava ofuscando o heavy metal. And looking at the British psychedelic scene. E olhando para o cenário psicodélico britânico We very clearly see it go in two different directions. Psychedelic rock, or I'm sorry, progressive rock that way, heavy metal that way. É, a gente claramente pode ver indo em duas direções, sendo uma o rock progressivo e a outra o rock psicodélico. But I would say in closing that I think the, the general contributions. Ah, ele gostaria de encerrar dizendo que rock made across the board and across its different geographical centers really became permanent part of all later rock music every later rock style benefited from the technological and uh, production advances that psychedelic rock created. And in that sense, I think psychedelic rock impacted everything that 
came after it, which is why I and where I started. I see psychedelic rock as the linchpin of rock music evolution. I really do. Could you repeat that, please, making pauses? Sure. I believe that the technological and Ele productive que... advancements of psychedelic rock os avanços tecnológicos e uh, the psychedelic, uh, the technological and stylistic, stylistic estilísticos do psicodélico impacted all later rock styles. Impactaram em todos os estilos de rock que surgiram depois. Which brings us back que nos leva de volta to the title of my lecture. Da palestra. I believe that psychedelic rock, Ele acredita que o rock psicodélico is the linchpin é o pivô of rock music evolution. Da evolução da música do rock. Sim, eu, eu, eu acho que é isso. A gente, a gente como nós já estamos no, no, no avançado da hora aqui, e da, do, do tempo que a gente tinha combinado com o professor, eu acho que a gente podia encerrar e agradecer o o, o professor pela pela palestra e por ter respondido as perguntas é, de uma mm. forma muito, muito rica. Né? E, We é, would acho... like to thank you for your uh, wonderful lecture and uh, as we are reaching the end of our time for today, uh, thank you also for answering the questions in such a rich way. It has been my great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Ele agradece pelo convite. Nós que agradecemos, né? e muito obrigado mesmo, muito grato por, pela disposição e por, pela palestra toda. Foi um, uma grande noite para nós, tarde talvez, uh, nos Estados Unidos. Muito obrigado, professor. We would like to deeply appreciate you for your time and for the lecture. It was a wonderful evening here in Brazil, as afternoon there in the United States. It was a wonder af wonderful afternoon here in Northern mm -hmm. California. <laughs> Ele disse que foi uma maravilhosa tarde na Norte da Califórnia. Muito obrigado a todos. Então, gostaria de só agradecer a todos que nos acompanharam até aqui. E amanhã, então, continuamos com as palestras do, do evento. Né? Então, boa noite a todos e até amanhã. <música>